Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension, Cooperative Extension, and on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Christy Remacall. She was born in Prescott, Arizona, and grew up in Taos, New Mexico. And then she went to MIT for her undergraduate in environmental engineering, went to Cal Berkeley to get her PhD in environmental engineering, and then went to the Swiss Federal Institute for Technology in Zurich in Switzerland to do a postdoc, and she's been here at UW-Madison since 2012. She's here to talk about one of our favorite things, lampreys. She's going to talk about the environmental fate of lamprecides and tributaries of the Great Lakes. This week is the run-up to Earth Week, uh, and Earth Day, excuse me, and I think it's a particularly interesting topic to think about what one of these special days sponsored and started largely by Gaylord Nelson of Wisconsin, how we look at things today compared to 1970 when Earth Day first started. Please join me in welcoming uh, Christy Remacall of Civil and Environmental Engineering to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, is it, volume is okay? Well, thank you, um, Tom, for the invitation to be here. And thank you all. Um, a really big thanks for coming out with the bad roads and weather. Um, like I said, it was, I had low expectations. But it's really nice to see um, all you out here. Is it okay? Okay. Um, Right, so as Tom said, I'm going to present some of our work looking at the fate of lamprecides. Lamprecides are pesticides which are used to kill the sea lamprey. So um, I'll sort of talk about why we use them and what happens to them once we put them out in the environment. Um, I'm coming from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, and I'm also in the Environmental Chemistry and Technology program here at UW-Madison. Um, and the project I'm going to present is really near and dear to my heart. This is the first project I started when I came to Madison. Um, so I've been working on this for, I guess, the last six years. Um, so to give you an overview of what I'll be talking about, first, I want to set the stage and talk about lamprecides, what they are. Um, and they're used to kill the sea lamprey. So I'm actually going to start by telling you a little bit about the sea lamprey. Um, how many people have heard of the sea lamprey before? Most of you, yeah. They're, I don't know, gross, scary fish. So um, I'll show you some pictures of them. And then I'm an environmental chemist, and so I really care about you know, we put these chemicals in the environment and they do their job to kill this um, really nasty invasive species, and then I want to find out what happens to them um, out in the environment. And so we'll start simple. We'll start with um, some experiments we did in the laboratory under very well controlled conditions, and then um, I'll take you out into the field. Um, our group focuses on photodegradation, so that's how sunlight can naturally cause chemicals to break down. Um, so this is a natural process. Um, and that's what we're going to focus on. And what we'll see is that even though in the lab we can look at the chemicals degrading by light, um, we can identify um, the products, the chemicals they break, turn down, turn into. Um, and what I'll show you is that they can actually, they change from something that's toxic to something that's non-toxic, which is a really good thing. Um, but when we move out to the field, sort of it is hindsight is 2020, and we picked our field sites pretty poorly. We didn't actually see much photodegradation out in the field of the sites that we picked. Um, and we can explain it and, and talk about that, and, but part of the story is also some of the challenges when we go from our well-controlled conditions in the laboratory out into the environment and some of the other factors that come into play. Um, so if we knew now, uh, or if we knew then what we know now, we might have picked sites differently, but it, it's still an interesting story to go through. And we do think that photodegradation, um, so this natural breakdown by sunlight, is going to be important in some systems, and we can kind of calculate how important it is going to be. Um, I want to start, I have a huge list of people to thank. Um, this is really a team effort. The, the main person here um, is Megan McConville. She was my first PhD student in my lab. She's actually holding a sea lamprey there and looking very happy about it um, for some reason. Um, and then uh, Laura and Natan are undergrads who contributed to this project. Um, we also did a lot of work with USGS, um, particularly Terry Hubert. He was a really big asset in helping us um, really understand the system. And then for the field studies, um, the two in the middle on the bottom, Steve and Sean, are, so US Fish and Wildlife is the group that actually goes and puts these chemicals in the water. 
Uh, and so we worked really closely with them on all the field work, like in the middle of the night, um, in the pouring down rain, sampling with them. And we couldn't have done this work without them. And then Adam is a hydrologist who helped with some of the modeling um, that I'm going to show. And then the, most of this work was funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission. This is the US and um, Canadian agency that actually oversees the sea lamprey control, control program. Um, this, is, this fish is a problem in both the US and Canada, so it's really nice that they work together. And they've been really supportive of our work. Um, and then we also got a little bit of funding from the Sea Grant and then the National Science Foundation. Um, so I want to start, I guess, by introducing you to the villain in our story, which is, of course, the sea lamprey. Um, and you've probably seen pictures like this before. Um, so the sea lamprey is an invasive species. It's found in all of the Great Lakes. Um, and there are a lot of invasive species in the Great Lakes. You hear a lot about different species. Um, and the reason why the sea lamprey is such a big deal is because it's a parasite. And so it preys on large fish like lake trout, walleye, catfish, and so on. Um, and you can see in this first picture, there's those like sucker-like fish. And they basically you know, attach to a fish. Um, and you can see on this picture, there are actually some wound marks from where the lamprey attached. Um, and this is obviously can be lethal in many cases for the fish. And this has been a really big deal for harming fisheries. And that's why it's a really important to control the population of these fish. Uh, the sea lamprey have been around for a really um, long time. So they came in through shipping canals, so from the Atlantic Ocean. So they were first found in um, Lake Ontario in the 1800s, and then as we opened up more and more shipping canals, they kind of made their way westward. And so they were found um, in Lake Erie in 1921, and then they made, made their way westward, so they were found in Lake Superior by 1938. Um, so they've been around for a really long time. Um, and one of the reasons we care about this is because of their impact on the fisheries, um, especially the large commercial game fish. Um, what I'm showing here is data that shows the commercial lake trout harvest um, with time um, in Lake Superior on the top and Lake Michigan on the bottom. And you can see up until about the 1940s or 1950s, there was a pretty nice stable harvest. And then there was this big plummet um, that came down. You know, the populations basically crashed. And so I marked here in red the years when the sea lamprey were first detected in each of these lakes. And then about a decade, 10, 15 years later, there was this big crash. Um, and I don't want, to, want you to think that the sea lamprey were the only thing that caused the crash of the fisheries. There are other chemical stressors and other, other issues going on as well, but the sea lamprey definitely contributed pretty heavily to the decline of the fisheries during this time. Um, the good news, though, is that if you look further out with time, you can see the fisheries, I mean, they're not back to where they were, but they've definitely been steadily improving. Um, and the sea lamprey control pro program has actually, it's actually really effective at maintaining the, the population of the sea lamprey at sort of a a low level as best they can. It's been really successful, and that's helped the fisheries to come back. Uh, so I'm going to talk, I'm a chemist, um, but I need to talk a little bit about the fish biology, um, just because it's really important to know that, to know why they do the, the sea lamprey control the way that they do. Um, and so this is, yeah, sort of the life cycle of the fish. And so they start out down here at the bottom in, as larvae. And this is a picture that we took up at USGS um, in La Crosse. And they're sort of these like worm-like little creatures. They live in the sediments. Um, they start out their life, and they're not parasitic. So that means they're not going to like attach to larger fish. After several years, they undergo a transformation, or like a metamorphosis. And that's when they get like the big, scary teeth. Um, and then at that point, once they're parasitic, they go out into the Great Lakes where they feed on large fish. Um, and then they're like salmon. They, they go re return to the tributaries to spawn. They're not pick picky. They're not like salmon in that they go always go to the same place. They can go to any tributary they want to, um, which actually makes it kind of harder to control them in a way. Um, but they do return back to the tributaries to reproduce. And so the tributaries, I guess I should define, those are all the rivers that feed into the Great Lakes. And they spend a lot of their life in those rivers. And so for that reason, all the efforts to control the population of the sea lamprey focus on the rivers, on the tributaries. Um, and that's because they're sort of in a more contained area. And that's also where they spend when they're larvae. So that's when they're most vulnerable, um, at least for the chemical stressors. And so that's why the sea lamprey control really focuses on those tributaries. Now, to give you a sense of scale, um, how widespread these fish are, 
Um, this is a nice map put together by Mike Sifkis, and every dot on this map shows a tributary with a known sea lamprey population. Um, so you can see that it spans both um, the Great Lakes in the US and in Canada. Um, there are total around 450 tributaries that have sea lamprey living in them. Um, this is about, there are about 5,000 tributaries altogether, so this is about 8% of the rivers around the Great Lakes have a sea lamprey infestation. Um, so this gives you a sense of scale and why it's really important that both US and Canada work together to control these fish. As far as sea lamprey control goes, there are a, a bunch of different things that are used. Um, first of all, you can put in barriers to prevent migration. So the fish, when they're going to reproduce, they swim upstream. So if you put up in a barrier and they can't go upstream, they can't go upstream and reproduce. Of course, this will prevent any native fish um, that also need to go upstream, so you have to be careful about that. Um, and there's work done on like sort of how to be more selective about which fish can go upstream. You can actually go out and physically trap them, um, the larger fish, and catch them and, and kill them. So they do that in some instances. They also sometimes will release sterile males, so try to decrease um, fertility by putting out um, male fish that can't reproduce. Uh, there's some really interesting work going on now with pheromones. Pheromones are chemicals that the fish can smell, and they actually have identified pheromones that the fish really like and that the fish really don't like. I think they take like dead sea lamprey and it's like a dead sea lamprey extract, um, basically. But it's, you can think about, you might put a chemical that they like in one stream and a chemical that they don't like in another stream and make them all go to where, you know, one spot and then you can trap them or do something else. Um, and this is not really widely used yet, but it's sort of up and coming and like where the, a lot of the research is on like new directions for sea lamprey control. And then last but not least is what I'm going to talk about, which are the lampricides. These are the two chemical pesticides, and these are the most widely used. Um, they've been used a really long time, and they're used all around the Great Lakes, and they've, they've been really effective. Um, so let me, I guess, now that we know a little bit about the fish, I want to show you a little bit about these two chemicals. Um, and there are two of them. And so, like I said, adding the lampricides is the most common way to control a sea lamprey, and there are, are two. So the one that's in blue here, um, 3 trifluoromethyl 4 nitrophenol which I'll just call TFM for short because that's just easier. This chemical is pretty interesting. We've started using it in the 1950s, um, so it's been put in our waters for a really long time, and it's considered to be selective for the sea lamprey. Um, so back in the 1950s, they tested thousands of chemicals um, on sea lamprey and also on native fish. And TFM, they found, was really good at killing the sea lamprey and less, um, not as toxic for native fish. And this has to do with the fact that, again, I'm not, I'm not a biologist, but the sea lamprey are really ancient species and they don't have the, they're not able to get rid of the chemical. And so it um, is able to kill them pretty effectively. Um, so TFM is added pretty much at all streams where they're adding these chemicals. Um, it's added all the time at a rate of about 50,000 kilograms per year, which is a lot. I'll show you some pictures here in a minute so you can kind of get a sense of the scale. Um, in total, they treat about 120 tributaries every year in the US and Canada, usually on a three to four year cycle, and that's because of the life cycle of the fish. So they'll treat a, a, re a river, and then three or four years later, they'll come back and treat it again, usually. Um, so TFM is selective. It's used everywhere. And then in some tributaries, they also have the chemical that's in orange, which is niclosamide. I'm not going to bother with the whole chemical name because it's really long. Niclosamide is added as a percentage by weight, so about 1% by weight with TFM in some tributaries, um, usually in the really large river systems or in areas where the water is moving really slowly. So it's not added as often. It's added in a lower concentration. Um, and that's probably a good thing because this chemical is an active ingredient in balicide, which is for killing mollusks. Um, so that kills other kinds of organisms as well. And so it's not going to be as, it's going to be more toxic to like non-target organisms, things that they're not trying to harm. Um, so we'll t I'll talk about both of them, um, but it's important to remember that TFM is the one that's used the most. Um, it actually degrades the most quickly too, which is a good thing. Um, so I want to show you some pictures so you can kind of envision this. I really, before I started working on this, really didn't have a good appreciation of the scale um, of what one of these treatments looked like. It's really, really impressive, especially when you're out on a really big river. Um, so first of all, this is the kind of trailer that they carry the chemicals around in. And so you can just imagine like driving down the highway next to this um, 
<laughs> trailer is pretty amazing. You know, they have their fish on the side, the lamprey on the side of a fish, and then they're all the big like sucker mouth on the side. But these are the trailers that they haul chemicals around in. This is a huge operation. So this is up from the Manistique River up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, um, I guess about a year and a half ago now. And the, the fishery, I'll show you a map a little later, but it's such a big operation, they pretty much filled up every hotel in town with people working on this. Like, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So these are toxic chemicals. You can see on the picture um, on the left, you know, it's, it's a toxic chemical, it's a pesticide. It's labeled toxic with like a skull and crossbones. Um, and then the bigger picture, there's someone from Fish and Wildlife that's pumping those chemicals into the river. Um, and I think at that site, this was just a small tributary. It was something like eight or nine of those cans an hour being pumped into the river, which is pretty impressive to see. And then in some cases, you can actually see it in the river. And it's maybe a little hard to see in here, but um, you can see there's like a the little bit of yellow splash where the chemicals being mixed in. Um, and then, yeah, it goes and does its thing. And the way that they add it, they're trying to get acute toxicity, which means they want to kill the fish right away. Um, and so they, they add the chemical in like an eight or nine hour block. And they try to make sure the chemical concentration is the same for eight or nine hours, and then they turn off the switch. And then they'll come back three or four years later is kind of how it works. Um, and if you can imagine like a really big river system, like maybe if you have two rivers coming together, they'll add the chemical, and they have it all worked out so like the chemicals come together at the same time. Um, it's, like I said, a really impressive operation. And they're actually out there in the field and in real time measuring the concentrations, the amounts in the water, to make sure it's um, the, the right amount. So they're adding what they need to achieve toxicity, but not too much that they harm native you know, other fish. Um, so like I said, it, it's really impressive, and I, I really didn't appreciate, appreciate it until I got to go out and see it. Um, so as a chemist and now as an environmental engineer, you know, we put these chemicals in. There's obviously trade-offs with doing that. Um, the sea lamprey are a really, you know, big deal and important to control. But the chemist in me and the engineer in me is like, okay, so what happens to the chemicals after they've done their, their thing? Um, wh where do they go? Um, and so what we knew when we started this project, um, there were, I mean, they've been used for a long time and there's been a lot of work done on them. So we knew some things to start. Um, first of all, neither chemical undergoes hydrolysis. This is um, an, a transformation process that happens when the chemicals react with water. A lot of pesticides do this, these chemicals don't, so they're not going to spontaneously break down. Um, they're going to be pretty stable. Neither chemical is volatile, which means it's not going to go into the air. It's going to stay in the water. Um, or it can go into the sediment, so into the soil. For niclosamide, the one in orange, it's a little bit of a bigger chemical, so it's going to be more sticky. It's going to associate with the sediment uh, more, um, whereas TFM is going to pretty much stay in the water. Um, so we're going to add it to the water, and it's going to stay in the water. They do undergo biological degradation, so some ty types of bacteria can make them break down um, under some conditions, and there's some work still being done to learn more about that process. And then when we started this project, we saw that there were a couple papers suggesting that degradation by sunlight or photodegradation was important. Um, and again, this is, yeah, sunlight causing the chemicals to break down. And so to tell you a little bit more about that process, um, this is my photochemistry 101. Pretty simple, this is a manistique. Um, on the one day, which it was sunny, which is one of the reasons why we didn't see much photodegradation there, it turns out. But um, the idea here is that we have our sun, the chemicals absorb light, um, they, they're, I'll show you their spectrum in a minute. They overlap with the solar spectrum, and it's possible that they can fall apart um, into chemicals that, you know, we actually characterize those, and we found out that they're ones that are not going to be as toxic, which is a good thing. Um, and so I guess let me show you a little bit more about what they look like. So this figure here, let me walk you through it, um, is important. So the dark blue line shows the solar spectrum. This is the wavelengths of light that are coming into the Earth. And so what you can see is that Starting at about 300 nanometers and up, those are the wavelengths of light that, the sunlight that hits our Earth. Um, the lines in orange and blue are the absorbance spectra of TFM and niclosamide. These are the wavelengths of light that those chemicals absorb. And the main point here is that there's a lot of overlap between the chemicals, um, UV vis spectra, and the solar spectrum. And so to put that another way, that means they, they overlap with the incoming light, um, so they can absorb light and they can break down potentially. Um, that's sort of the first rule of photochemistry. If those two curves didn't overlap, there would be no possible way of having photodegradation at all. 
Um, so we knew this sort of coming in, that they do absorb light. Um, and we also knew a little bit more about their um, behavior from some older studies, um, so one from 1981 and one from 2004. And so here what we knew from these, work, these works, again, that they're sort of my cartoon where it's, we have sunlight reacting with our two chemicals, causing them to break down. We knew that this process depends on the pH, so that's like the acidity of, um, of your water. Most waters, um, rivers are going to be around a pH between 6 and 8, usually more like 7 or 8, um, so that's like neutral pH. But if you have the pH higher or pH lower, the, how quickly these chemicals are going to break down is going to change. We also knew something about their half-lives, um, and this is a term I'm going to use quite a bit, and so a half-life is the time it takes for half of the chemical to go away. And so if you have something that has a half-life of a minute, that means it's going to go away really quickly. And if it's something, a half-life of five days, that's going to take a really long time. Um, so I'm going to use half-life, again, as sort of a way to measure how quickly these chemicals are breaking down. And so we knew, this is actually from the 1981 study, that the half-life of TFM, and again, that's the chemical that's um, more specific for the sea lamprey, it's used in higher concentrations. Um, these researchers thought it would go away on the order of a few days. Um, so that's kind of a long time. And whereas niclosamide, the one that isn't used as often, they said it was going to go away on the order of 7 to 30 hours, and that was under their experimental conditions. Um, so you can think back. We, we know when we go from the lab out to real conditions, things are different. Um, and we actually found that this was quite different in practice. Um, so we knew a little bit. We knew enough to say, like, okay, this is probably important. We didn't know much about what the transformation products were, so what they break down into. And this is important to understand because um, there aren't very many examples, but there are some where a chemical undergoes photodegradation and it actually forms something that's more toxic than what you started with. Um, so that would not be good. Um, so we want to make sure that, the, that once it does break down, it's forming things that aren't going to be harmful. So we didn't know that, um, and we, no one had ever looked at these two chemicals under the same conditions before, um, and there, were, there was some room for, for adding a little bit more here, and we actually learned a lot. Um, so, I mean, you know, you all live in Wisconsin, you know what it's like, and so we do our experiments in the lab for starters, um, and this is a picture of our merry-go-round photoreactor, so it's like a little merry-go-round, you can see in the middle, um, you can see these are all test tubes in here, and that the little thing spins around, so it's like that's why it's called a merry-go-round. And on the outside, we have all our different light bulbs. Um, in this case, we're using light at 365 nanometers, which is in part of the solar spectrum. Um, and it's fun because it's a black light, so that's that's pretty much what it is. So that's kind of fun too. But yeah, this is how we do our experiments because um, we can put a whole bunch of test tubes in there and test a lot of different conditions and do a lot of different replicates, and like it's the same every day. So we can do these experiments when it's, the weather is like it is today, um, or in the summer, anytime. Um, so we, we did this, and the first thing we looked at was just when we shine this light on these two chemicals, how fast do they go away? Um, just as a first cut, wanting to verify what was already known in the literature. Um, and so, yeah, this is what this figure shows, and so on the um, x or y axis, this is a rate constant, so this is how quickly it goes away. So things that are higher up, they're going away quickly, and things that are slower, lower down, they're going away more slowly. And so we can see a couple things. First, um, with TFM, and this is all plotted versus pH, so the acidity of our water. Um, and again, most waters are going to be around pH 7. With TFM, as the pH goes up, the chemical degrades more quickly. Um, so, and it, it changes a lot depending on the pH. And niclosamide had the opposite trend. Um, so their behavior is going to be different. So as a pH goes up, TFM is going to degrade more quickly, whereas niclosamide is going to actually slow down. So that was one thing that we, we knew, or we learned. And the other thing was that, like I said, no one had ever looked at these two chemicals under the same conditions before, even though they're added together. So you'd think it would be good to look at them together. Um, and we can see there's a really big gap between those two curves. And what this means is that TFM is going to go away much more quickly than niclosamide. Um, and TFM is the one that's used in higher concentrations. It's more selective for the sea lamprey, and so it goes away much more quickly, whereas niclosamide, um, which is harmful to other organisms like mollusks, is going to go away much more slowly. And this sort of contradicted the earlier study, um, and that was a bit of a surprise. 
but I think, yeah, we, we learned a lot from this, and it, it, this is really valuable to find out how quickly they go away. Um, these are our lab conditions, um, and you know, we had that those black lights are obviously not what sunlight looks like, but we can do the math and kind of calculate how quickly these will go away under actual sunlight conditions. Um, and so, I apologize for showing a table, but it kind of gets the point across. So, what I'm showing here is the half-life. So again, we, a smaller number is better. We want to have a half-life being short because we want it to go away. Um, for TFM, looking just at the surface of the water, like if you're looking at the very top that's getting the most sunlight, um, it's going to go away on the order of a couple hours. Whereas niclosamide, even at the very surface of the water, it's going to go, on the way, go away on the order of a day or longer. And this is assuming that the sun is on at noon all the time, which is obviously not accurate. As you can imagine, though, this is looking at the surface of the water. And as you go deeper in the water, it obviously gets darker. Um, and it turns out the light actually drops off really quickly. And so if we, if we do the same calculation um, over like 55 centimeters, now we can see TFM is going to go away on the order of 20 hours or something like that. Um, and to close mind, we're talking hundreds of days, which is it, you know, obviously the water is not going to stay in a river for hundreds of days, so that's not very practical. Um, so what we learned from this, and I'll show you the data, a little more data on Norclosamide, but we basically learned that from a photochemical degradation perspective, that's really probably only going to be important for TFM. Um, and that's the one that's more selective, it's less persistent, and it's added pretty much everywhere. Um, whereas Norclosamide, which is yeah, less, less selective, um, it's going to stick around a lot longer in the rivers. Um, so we, we know about the rates, and we, have, we can make good calculations about how quickly they're going to go away. Um, the other question is to figure out what they degrade into. Um, for both of them, we found that they're going to degrade into things that are going to be less harmful, which is a really a good thing, and that was really good to learn. Um, and so I believe it or not, I did try to simplify this a lot. <laughs> it's really complicated. But the basic idea is we start with TFM. The main product is this, um, this chemical called gentistic acid. Um, and there are, I think we detected, we quantified, I don't know, maybe four or five other chemicals, and we identified a lot of other chemicals. It, it basically makes a whole soup of different things. But what's important is that if we look at TFM, um, it has this fluorine in it, that's a F, and then this NO2 group, the nitro group, those are both signs that a chemical is going to be really persistent. And I'll show you in a minute that things that have fluorine or chlorine on them are really common in a lot of contaminants that we worry about. So the fact that we're losing those chemicals is a really good thing. Um, and I guess, yeah, to show you some more data, what that actually looks like in practice, we did a bunch of modeling. And we could see that the blue is showing TFM going away. We could see gentistic, at, gentistic acid forms. And then it goes away as well, because it also undergoes photodegradation. And that's part of what ma makes understanding the, the chemical mechanism really complicated, is because all of the products also photodegrade. So they, they form, and then they go away. And so we have a whole bunch at the bottom that are really low concentrations, because they form and they go away so quickly. And then what I think is really important and that I want to emphasize is that we do form fluoride. Um, so that's like just a salt. That's not harmful at all. Um, but we're losing our fluoride from our fluoro methyl group here, and we can actually see production of fluoride um, coming in, um, which is really a good thing. Niclosamide, I'm not even going to show you any of the or, um, organic products because it's like a mess. We quantified, I think, something like nine different chemicals and then identified the molecular weights of something like 30 more. It, it basically, the chemical falls apart right in the middle of the chemical, and it makes a whole bunch of different things. Um, but again, it's losing the chlorines, which I circled in red up there. Um, so we can see the formation of chloride here. So it's losing those two uh, chlorine atoms. And then we can see the formation of nitrate, which is coming from this nitro group here. Um, and that's a really good thing. Those, those chemicals, the chlorine and fluorine, um, are markers of really kind of persistent chemicals. So I actually want to take a little bit of a, an aside and kind of show you a little bit about that. So the halogen group is in the um, seventh group of the periodic table. It's the one I have circled in the box. So we start with fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. These are really electronegative atoms, and they form uh, really polar bonds. And it, it's really kind of hard to break those carbon-halogen bonds. Um, and we see these chemicals, these 
the, these halogens in a lot of chemicals that are like kind of our classic contaminants or even newer contaminants. Whenever you see halogens in a chemical, you're like, that's probably not a good thing. It's usually going to be toxic. It's usually going to be persistent. Um, and so I can give you a few examples here. So there's a lot of good examples of chlorinated compounds. Um, so a good one is DDT. Um, who's heard of DDT before? Probably everyone, right? So it's been around, it was around a long time. We don't use it anymore, which is a good thing. But this is the, chemo the insecticide that Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring about. Um, so Silent Spring, the title, refers to a spring where there's no birds because this insecticide has killed all the birds. Um, so this is a really harmful one. Um, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, these are used in coolants. Um, they're also not used anymore, but they're really persistent. You can still find them in the sediments of the Great Lakes um, because they, these really stick to the sediments. They're still around. They're, they're, they last a really long time. PCE, this is used in dry cleaning. Um, a lot of times dry cleaning fluid leaks underground, so we find these chlorinated solvents in our groundwater frequently, and they're also really persistent. We, these chemicals are really common in the environment, um, but you know you can see they all have those halogens in them. Um, these are kind of what I would call classic contaminants, and then um, there are also emerging contaminants. I don't know, we call them emerging contaminants. We've been studying them for a while now, but these are chemicals that we people in my area are really interested in and looking at right now. And so we can show examples of brominated compounds like this um, polybrominated diphenyl ether, um, PBDE. These are flame retardants. These are added to like couches and furniture and things like that at kind of shockingly high concentrations. And I don't know, if you look at them, it looks a lot like the PCBs except they have that oxygen there in the middle, but it's, I don't know why we thought this was a good idea, I don't know, because they're pretty toxic and they're really persistent um, and hard to break down. And the fluorinated compounds, um, I put up a couple, PFOS and PFOA, these are really interesting looking chemicals. These are used, um, or were used, or they've just phased them out in like Scotchgard and things like that. Um, you, they're also used in uh, firefighting foams like at airports, and these are, you'll see these, if you pay attention to these, you'll see these in the news a lot for contaminating groundwater um, recently. These are sort of a hot topic at the moment. Um, but I wanted to just talk about this because if we think about the two chemicals that we've been studying, these lamprosides, you know, niclosamide has two chlorine atoms on it, um, TFM has three fluorine um, atoms on it, and the fact that those halogens are going away when the chemical does undergo photodegradation is a really good thing. Um, the chemicals that it turns into are going to be ones that are going to be easy for bacteria to eat. They're basically food at that point. Um, they look pretty tasty to bacteria. Um, so once they lo lost those halogen groups, they're not going to be things that we're worried about. Um, so even though the rates, especially for niclosamide, are quite slow, once they do break down, they're going to form things that we're not concerned about. And so that was really good to learn that. OK, so we did this work um, looking at what happens in the lab um, where things are very well behaved. And then we wanted to find out, does it happen in the field? Um, and sort of like I said at the top, you know, hindsight is 2020. We might have picked different sites if we'd done this again, but it was, you know, it's all sort of happening at the same time. Um, and so we went to three different sites, um, two in 2015 and two in 2016. And so in 2015, these were tributaries that are, they're actually, this is, this bottom map shows all three sites on the same scale. So here are the first two that I'm going to show. They're really tiny. They barely show up there at all. And then here's the Manistique, which is Huge, and this was the one that I said they filled up like every hotel in town because there are so many people working on this. For these two small sites, these are really simple. Basically, what they're doing um, up here at this upper, where that green dot is, they add the chemical once, and then the chemical just goes downstream. So they just add it in, and that's it. They just leave it alone. Um, so what we did here on these two sites, um, we sampled just downstream. This is our upstream site. We sampled just downstream of where they added the chemical. And then we sampled as close as we could get to the river mouth. And what we, we also did in parallel to this, um, we added sodium bromide, which is a salt. Um, it's a tracer. And so this basically lets us quantify or measure how much water, where the water is going in the system. And so we measured the bromide at the top and the TFM at the top of the water, the reach, and then the bromide and the TFM at the bottom. And we could calculate how much was lost over and, and see, like, do we see any loss due to photodegradation? Um, and so we did that at these two sites. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a, minute, in a minute. And then 
In 2016, we went out on the Manistique River, and this is a huge river. Every one of these, I know it's a little small, but every one of these green points is a point where they're adding chemical. Um, and again, think of that they're wanting to get all the chemical by the time it wakes, makes its way to the mouth, that all the chemical and all those side tributaries are wanting to come together at the exact same time and the exact same concentration. Um, so it's, a, it's an amazing operation. Um, and then every white dot on the figure, that's where they're out and they're actually measuring the chemical concentration in real time. And if the chemical concentration is too low, they're gonna add a little bit more in um, to make sure the concentration stays the same. Um, so this is a huge operation. Um, and so for the first, the two smaller tributaries, they only added TFM. Um, TFM is often added only by itself. And in this big river system, they're adding both TFM and niclosamide together. So they're measuring both in the field. So I'm going to show you the, um, the data from these first two smaller tributaries first. Um, and again, I'll show you some more pictures. This is um, someone from Fish and Wildlife who's actually setting up to put the chemical in. You can see this is a really small tributary. Um, you can kind of see it's maybe a, a meter or so across. Um, down here on the bottom right, there's his can of TFM. Um, in this toolbox, it's basically a pump, and it's pumping the chemical out. He has like a little drip line. Um, they sort of picked a reach where there's a little bit of turbulence to kind of mix up the chemical and get it distributed across the river. But that's pretty much it. He's going to set this up. He's going to let it run for about 10 hours, and then that's it for this site. We added, we actually went, we had to do it on a different day because they wouldn't let us add the bromide on the same day. We went back the next day. Um, here, that's yeah, very fancy field equipment, a trash can, <laughs> which we filled up with this salt, this sodium bromide, mixed it up with a big stick, and then poured it in the river all at one shot. Um, and then we had our um, poor students downstream rapidly <laughs> collecting samples as quick as you could um, so we could really capture those chemicals and see what happened. And so this is what the data looks like. So on the top, this top panel shows the TFM concentration and the bottom shows bromide. So the lighter color blue, this is the, the TFM concentration measured right downstream of where they added the chemical. And you can see, okay, nothing's happening. Well, I guess my students slept in a little late that day. They didn't get those first couple points. But you can imagine nothing's happening. Then they turn the chemical on. It's staying steady concentration around 20 micromolar for about 10 hours. And then they stop pumping in the chemical, and then it drops off again. And then we went downstream as far as we can, and we measure the chemical. We can see it's starting to come up. Concentration's lower. Um, it lasts about the same time. And then the chemical goes away again once they stop adding it. Um, so then we did the same thing with bromide, and this was the one that we like dumped the trash can of chemical into the water. Um, and this is a salt, it's just a harmless tracer. Um, when we measure it downstream, we can see we see a huge spike of the chemical from dumping in the whole big bucket. Um, and that's you know, reaching concentrations of around 700 um, micromolar. And then looking downstream, you know, th th things sort of spread out, you know, things aren't moving down in a nice neat block, things diffuse a little bit we can measure the chemical at the bottom. And this is really useful to us, actually, to collect the data at the top and the bottom, because what we can do is um, basically calculate the area under that curve and calculate how much mass we had at the beginning, like what was our total mass added versus our total mass that we're measuring at the bottom. Um, and the reason that we did the tracer is because the, the sodium bromide tracer, we know, isn't going to undergo any chemical reactions. It's only going to move with the water. Um, and we know. If you imagine water flowing downstream, it can, some of it can actually go into the ground, um, into the hyperreic zone, um, and that's actually what we saw. Um, so what we saw was about looking at the tracer and comparing the areas under the curve, we lost about 30% of the mass that we added um, to this exchange with the groundwater. Looking at the areas under the TFM curve, we saw we lost 34% of the TFM. Um, and within error, those are pretty much the same number. And so what this means is that any TFM that we lost, any of the lamprosite that we didn't measure at the bottom that we added, that's because it's also going to the, to the groundwater, the same as we saw with the, the sodium bromide salt. And then because we had done all the work to identify all the possible degradation products, we could look for them, um, and we didn't find any. Um, so both of those two things together told us, like, OK, we didn't see any photodegradation. Um, well, OK, we're, but we, we're sure that we didn't see it. Um, we have those two ways of sort of telling that. Um, looking at Sullivan Creek, the other really small tributary is the same. 
you can see what it looks like. It's a little bit of a bigger, um, a little bit bigger, but it's still pretty small, really forested, um, really beautiful up there um, on the UP. And the data is really similar, where we, we have the top panel that shows um, TFM, you know, higher concentration of the, the upper stream, and then it decreases on the lower stream. Um, and then we did our sodium bromide tracer test again here. And I didn't put the percentages up there, but again, they were basically about the same, where the amount of salt that we lost in our tracer test was the same as the amount of TFM that we lost in the actual chemical application of the lamprosite. And so, again, we didn't see any photoproducts here. And so we're like, OK, we didn't see any photo degradation. Um, at the same time, we sort of worked out all of our you know, measurements in the lab. And we're like, OK, well, we probably should have known that. Um, because the residence time, so the amount of the time that it takes from when we add the chemical to when it reaches the Great Lake, um, Lake Superior, is about one, hour, one to four hours, depending on which river we're talking about. And our half-life, so the time it takes for the chemical, half of it to go away, is 12 hours. Um, so in retrospect, that's not really a surprise. We probably should have known that. Um, but like I said, that's, that's part of the challenge. And so we're like, OK, well, this, 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 chemical, this river was really small. Um, we want something where the chemical is going to be in the river for a really long time. And so we went to basically the, one of the biggest river systems that they treat, um, which is the Manistique River. Um, and I showed you this map before. Um, and again, with the Sullivan Creek and Carpenter Creek, those two little rivers I showed you, I guess creeks, they don't really count as rivers. They're really small. Those are up there on the same scale. And then here's our Manistique River, which is, I mean, it pretty much goes across the whole UP. It's, it's really big. Um, and it's a really wide river. It's not as shaded. And the chemical from the time it's added at the most furthest upstream point to the time it makes it all the way down is three in, over three days. Um, so we're like, OK, three days. You know, we've done our math. You know, we think we should see something here. And so what we did here, um, we didn't sample the whole thing. This is a, a huge operation. We sampled it where all the blue triangles are. Um, and so we could basically follow the chemical block as it was moving downstream. And one thing to remember here is that there they're working really hard to make sure the chemical concentration is the same throughout the whole river. Um, again, at all those white dots, they're actually out in the fields measuring it and then adding more chemical as needed. Um, so to show you some more pictures of what this um, river looks like, first we're going to look at the Cookson Bridge, which was the site we have labeled here M1. This was the furthest upstream that we, site that we sampled. You can see this is a really, really wide river. There's a whole bridge across this. Um, what they did basically at this site, this was a boosting site. So they were actually there measuring the chemical concentration and saying like, OK, it's a little lower than we want. So they're adding in a little bit more to kind of bump it up. So they had the, the chemicals here at the bottom. There's the pump. And then they have this like drip line that they, I think the Fish and Wildlife actually in this picture is trying to get this drip line um, across the river where they could drip the chemical in. Um, so that's. That's what they were doing there. Um, and then there's my student, Megan. We were you know, sampling over the bridge, throwing in a can or bucket and pulling up a sample. And she's holding a big sond, which is um, this big instrument. It has a bunch of measures, temperature and pH, and a whole bunch of things in real time. Um, so we're doing a bunch of measurements there off the side of the bridge. Um, and then this was like, so I'm a chemist. I like to stay in the lab. I don't like to do field work. But this was really nice field work because they, the lab kind of came to us. and so. This is a Fish and Wildlife mobile analysis trailer, um, which was really nice because this was midnight in the pouring down rain. So it was really nice to have a nice place to go inside. But they have these like trailers that are basically mobile laboratories that they take out on these big field sites. And they're actually m measuring these chemicals like in real time. This one, this instrument here, this is a UV -vis spectrometer. This is for measuring TFM. It's in a higher concentration, so they basically just it basically takes advantage of that UV vis spectra that I showed you. They shine light on it and they can measure the concentration. Um, and then this is a, a more a fancier instrument. It's a high performance liquid chromatograph. This is for measuring the um, And so Steve Lance, I showed you a picture of him at the beginning. He, you know, he was out there in the middle of the night measuring the chemical concentration, making sure that what they were adding was right. Um, and there was a couple poor guys in boats in the pouring down rain downstream collecting samples and bringing them back. And you can just imagine. Um, it was a good bonding experience um, being out there for it. Um, but it was, we, it was pretty interesting to see. And this is what the data looks like. Um, so let me walk you through it. The top is TFM, the bottom is niclosamide. Um, and this we're looking over several days. Again, remember, this is a, a multi-day treatment process. It lasts a really long time. So we have um, 
this is our first site, we can measure the TFM, and we're basically following that chemical block kind of as it moves downstream, um, what's going on. And then TFM, niclosamide is at a lower concentration, it's a lot messier, and that's because it sticks to the sediments, and so it's a little bit less behaved, less well behaved, um, we can see it. Um, and then we wanted to look for photo products, the transformation products, um, and we didn't find any, which was a bummer. <laughs> My poor grad student was really sad when we got this result. Um, we didn't find any. And the question was why? You know, we're thinking the half-life is something like 20 hours, and it was there for three days. I'm like, well, the environment is a messy place. It's a lot more complicated than we think it's going to be, and so we can actually adjust for it. And so, well, you can see I'm going to walk you through that, and this half-life is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as we go. But our initial estimate was about 20 hours. And we'll say, okay, well, first of all, that's not really a good estimate because this is assuming that the sun is on at, like noontime conditions all the time, which obviously is the sun is not shining 24 hours a day. And we're looking at a depth of 55 centimeters. So actually, the first thing we looked at was, well, that's a really deep river. It's about two meters deep. So if we, um, and this figure shows like how quickly light drops off with depth. And so thinking about how deep the water is is really important. So if we go from 55 centimeters to two meters, that triples the half-life. So the chemical just over in a deeper water is gonna go away three times more slowly. And then Madison is not Manistique um, in the UP. So it's the sun is, you know, it's sun is at a different angle. Um, so we corrected for that. Um, so you can see the, this is our sunlight data. This is what Madison is, it's basically higher um, gets, getting a little more light for that first calculation. This is a manistique in September. It's getting less light. Um, that, again, is going to make the chemical go away about two times, as, two times more slowly. Um, so the location is really important in this calculation. This isn't clear water. It has some color to it. Um, so we can account for that. That's going to slow us down a little bit more. Um, and then what is really gets us in trouble is when we actually take into account the fact that the sun is not on all the day. Um, and we can see, you know, we can model the sunlight and all that. Now we're getting up to a half-life of around 300 hours. And then I showed you the one picture from when it was like nice and sunny. That was the only time the sun was shining the whole time we were up there. Um, and so if you take into the cloud cover, now we're at around 600 hours um, of a half-life. So it's, it's gonna take 600 hours for half of the chemical to go away accounting for like the daily variability in sunlight and like everything else we can think of. And so we can take our lab data and we can explain what we saw in the field, um, but that sort of begs the question, well, does TFM ever undergo photolysis? Um, and so what we did here, you know, my poor student is finishing up her PhD. You know, we can't, we're not gonna go out and sample every river. Um, so we turned to doing some calculations. Um, and so Fish and Wildlife helped us out a lot here. We took data from all the tributaries they treated in 2015. Um, so 76 tributaries in, just in the US side. Um, and we took all the data from 2016, so another 63 tributaries. And we took into account how long the rivers were, um, the time of the year, all those factors that I just showed you um, to come up with half lives And that's shown here in this figure. And so we just, these are the two years. And basically what we want is a higher number. A higher number is more percent degradation. Um, and so what we did was, again, for all these tributaries um, that were treated in those two years, we took into account the stream depth. We took into account how long the chemical was in the water and the site-specific daily irradiation. Um, basically, what we found was that for 70 tributaries, they're below this 10% line. They really wouldn't see any photo degradation at all. Um, and you can see our first two sites are right there. So again, hindsight is 2020. Those probably weren't the best choices. Um, 58 tributaries are sort of, we might see some moderate degradation, and 11 tri tributaries, which are basically turn out to be longer and more shallow tributaries, we can actually see significant degradation. So if we're thinking just about the rivers themselves, this, you know, it's gonna be about 10% of the rivers we're gonna actually see significant photo degradation um, during a treatment application. So where do the chemicals go? Um, there's a couple things that I think are really important that I'm really interested in. Um, first of all is that groundwater. So I talked about this a little bit, this hyperreic zone. Um, below every river there's a hyperreic zone, which is basically where we have rapid exchange between the river and the groundwater. Um, we found in Sullivan and Carpenter Creek that about 20 to 30 percent of the chemical ends up in this river, in this, the hyperreic zone. Um, 
and then it comes back out again slowly. Um, and so we think what happens in the hyperreic zone, um, biodegradation could be really important because it's staying in the sediment longer. Um, there's a lot of bacteria there. That could be really important. Um, and so this is a, something that we're really interested in finding out more about. But at the end of the day, the chemical, most of it is going to come out and it's going to end up in the Great Lakes. Um, and even in the large systems like the, the Manistique River, they're adding chemical pretty much up to the mouth of where the river hits the Great Lakes. So that, because they want to keep that concentration constant, they want to make sure no sea lamprey like sneak up back in basically. Um, so a lot of the chemical does end up in the Great Lakes and there I think actually photodegradation is important. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, first of all, the, well, there's a bunch of reasons. So if the, the lake is stratified and the chemical stays in the top of the water, the water is much more clear. Um, so sunlight is going to go a lot deeper. And then the residence time, so the amount of time water stays in the Great Lakes is a really long time. So they're going to have a lot more chance to be exposed to sunlight. Um, and so this is something I, I'd be really interested in. These are like, I don't know the answer and I would really like to go out and do this, but I think that's probably going to be really important. And I think what we learned as far as the degradation rates and the transformation products are really important for thinking about what actually happens out in the Great Lakes. And so I'm going to wrap up there. A very nice wordy slide to sum it up. But basically what we learned was that degradation by sunlight to these two chemicals can be important under some conditions. Um, we know a lot more about how water chemistry affects it and we found that pH, the acidity of the water, was really important. We found that TFM goes away much more quickly than niclosamide. Um, I wouldn't expect to see niclosamide photodegradation in a tributary ever. Um, it's, it's really going to be very slow. And then we also found out that once the chemicals do degrade, they form chemicals that are going to be less harmful for the environment, um, which I think is a really important thing to consider. Um, yeah, we relied a lot on modeling um, to sort of predict how, off, how important this process is going to be. And then um, thinking about hyperreic zone storage as well as what happens in the Great Lakes themselves is really important for looking out in the future. Um, and so I want to end with this picture. I took this picture in that one of the fish and wildlife trailers. So that's our, the enemy, the sea lamprey. Um, and thank you all again for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thank you.